You know, I want to preface this portion of my demonstration with something that uh, took place here in the state of Georgia for the past week. You know, um, see, when, when, we, when we travel the path that Allah has laid through his community of prophets that have come down throughout the ages, um, and especially the one that was sent to us, you know, there's certain protections that come with that. You know, Allah won't allow certain things to befall you as long as you listen to it his commandments, you know. Um, however, when we see, and this is not us as individuals per se, but as a nation, a lot of times, when we lose our way, when we get off like the, you know, the straight and narrow path that the Quran of Mecca talks about, when we get off of that as a nation, sometimes Allah will allow the fire to touch some of us. That's not? Um, you know, I think my jump of time looking like, well, she, uh, she ran it up last week or this week. Last week. Last week. Um, one of our, our brother, uh, Grand Sheik, uh, uh, Clarence Prater Hill, Sheik's us down here, Temple 27, um, Brother Charles Brown Hill, um, his daughter was kidnapped. Okay? Now I'm quite sure if, you know, if you're on social media, you've seen this. But um, it was a little different for me because I've actually known her since she was like seven. Right? It was a child who was born in the Moore Science Temple of America. Right? Born ill. As long as um, Knew nothing of the world. Like she, all she knew was the Morris Science Temple of back. Islam, Islam, her parents had had her in the temple attending our meetings from birth all the way till she was grown. Islam, um, you know, the situation where she was in her home, no, parts of it, she was at work, left out of her job, and, you know, around 10 o'clock of that particular day, wasn't seen from again. To show you how Allah worked. That same, oh, a, no, a couple of days later, um, she brown ill and his family, they were, you know, his, you know children of boxers. They were coming from the boxing gym, training. Uh, they get in a car accident. Someone blows the light, hits their van, you know. Um, his youngest son got a concussion, all the kind of stuff. He sent his dog, he sent his wife, he called his wife, kind of, you know, a little out of, you know, out, of the, out of it or whatever. We just got an accident or whatever, so, and he hung up on his wife, you know, to check on the children because his youngest son was not, you know, unconscious. He didn't know if he was, he had, you know, past formula. So he's checking on him, hung up on his wife. Um, his wife immediately texts the daughter, you know, who she, you know, because she's, she's grown and she's 25, so she might not see her for a few days and then she come around the hospital. But she sent the daughter a message, basically saying, we're headed to the hospital because your father and him was just an accident. She gets to the hospital and then she's checking her phone. She never contacted her back, which was odd, right? Kept calling, kept calling, nothing, right? The next day, we kind of get a, you know, control over everything. She's reaching out, still couldn't contact her, okay? Um, Praise be to Allah, you know, after about four or five days, uh, someone found her wandering on the street mm. out of her normal state of mind. And a good Samaritan of sorts saw her, you know, called an ambulance and they got her to the you know, a hospital downtown called Grady Memorial, got her down there. And then um, not too long after, maybe about a few, four or five hours after that, she was able to call her father because she still had a phone on her. Right? But for whatever reason, it was switched off so they couldn't track it. Right? Why am I saying all this? I'm saying all this because what does the Moorish Science Temple of America really mean to us, right? Because if you cut, you'll, and you'll see this, you know, during the public sessions, you know, our temple, we have babies running all through here. You know, uh, I was sitting right with the National Grand, she was sitting on the holy day. I felt something tugging on my leg and looked under the table, it was a baby, like one of the babies just <laughs> messing with my foot, you know, praise Allah. But, um, you know, I, I just have a different, and this is just me personally, you know, I have a different mindset when it comes to protecting that which you love. You know, it takes a lot, you know, to get, you know, especially, you know, to get our sisters on board with the prophet saying because the society targets them because if you get her, you get the whole household. That's right. Islam? So when a sister makes the, you know, the you know, concentrated effort to say, I'm going to put all my energies behind this movement. I want my family to be a part of this. And to see whole families a part of that, you don't want nothing touching those families. Islam, Islam was? Islam. See, this is why, you know, giving honors to, you know, our home office, um, you know, it's the Supreme Grand Sheep of Turner, all my elders that are present. Because the labor that y'all put in over the years to compile that which we now refer to as the uniting of the more science type of America is so important for now. I've been to a lot of temples. I've sat there. 
and it's an empty car, Krishna. This is, I'm not being radical, I'm not violating Act, act 4, okay. there's no law, okay. that is not my intention. But truth is one of our principles, Paul. That's right. The ceremony's there, the form is there, but Allah's spirit is not there. Mm. It's not there, Mo. right? Um, every time I tune in, because you know, you, you all do your holy day meetings one hour before hours, so we usually tune in to y'all to get an inspiration to do ours, praise Allah. <laughs> And uh, that spirit be coming through the, the, the cyberspace to us and, you know, reverberate through the internet, you know? And um, praise a lot. But again, tying to the, the original topic, you know, and the question that I asked, which ties into the topic, you know, what does this really mean to us? See, it's very important to understand, you know, what the prophet gave to us because there's a whole wave of people out there that's referring to themselves as elves and babies. That's right. You mm -hmm. know? Um, and the world thinks that they are who we are really are. Right? The life that we live, they're, you know, I demonstrate it from a fraud perspective. Of, say, impersonation, they call it, right? Um, one more thought before I get into this demonstration, um, just in the sense of candor, because it's, on, it's only adepts here. Um, two years ago, uh, this temple was visited by Homeland Security, uh, Joint Terrorism Task Force. Um, Allah willing, Saturday, I bring the cards from the agents that came. And then following year, we have a visit from FBI. And you know, it's interesting, when somebody comes to you that you don't know, and it's quoting stuff you said in meetings years before, you know, um, know how you came in the movement, you know, who you were made under, and all these type of things, whatever, right? <clears throat> but the key was is that they weren't after the Prophet Noble Jirali, they said, we have no problem with him. We know what the most size to of America is. That's what they told me, where's my wife? She's my witness, she was there with me. Mm -hmm. um, I don't go on those meetings alone. <laughs> it's like, you want me with me, witness. Um, but the interesting part of it was, they're not after the Prophet, they have me. If you listen to the language, they honor what the Prophet brought. They're after these criminals that's operating, and according to their phrase, their phraseology, that's operating in the name of your organization. Right? Because they, we know that they're operating outside of what you teach. You teach your citizens. They teach their not citizens. So it's a language, right? Mm. So then when they said, you know, they, they were talking about the language thing, you know, I'm hearing my prophet. My prophet got me through this at this meeting. Islam. <laughs> Islam. And I just, my, my mind started you know, reflecting on the lessons. And the prophet tell you about language. Where that Quran at? Got that Quran? The prophet says something about language, Mo. He says, Something about he has fitted you with language. Do right? you remember something like that in our record, Mark? Yeah. Says, pardon me, Mark, I don't have my glasses on. It says, um, here we go. And again, Holy Quran of the more Science Temple of America, divinely prepared by the noble prophet Jirali. By the guiding of his father, God, Allah, the great God of the universe, to redeem man from his sin from a fallen stage of humanity, back to the highest plane of life of his father, God, Allah, Islam. Right. And again, confirming my intention, and my intentions on page three, dear readers, do not falsely use these lessons, but for good, peace, and happiness for all those who love Jesus. Islam. Right. Again, any good comes from a great God, Allah. Any mistakes or errors come from me, not to be put on our prophet, most certainly not Allah. Islam, Morris. Islam. All right. But our prophet instructs us, he says, but thee, he hath endured with reason to maintain thy dominion. He has fitted thee with language to improve thy society and exalted thy minds with the powers of meditation to contemplate and adore his inimitable perfections. Islam? So, you know, a lot of the times, the people, gratitude, the people that we, um, that come through the temple doors, um, we had a brother came through two weeks ago who tried to come through, but he stopped at the door. Um, he printed some sovereign citizen paperwork out wanted me to sign it. <laughs> He's gonna print some paperwork out and bring it to me to sign. I'm just gonna put my name on it. You know what I'm saying? Um, this is the, the thought that's going around about what our movement is, right? And the reason why this is the predominant, you know, predominant thought of what our movement is, is because sometimes we, we, we've slouched under our responsibility in terms of being on the forefront of representing the prophet, mm -hmm. putting this movement in a way where, you know, how do people access information now? Whenever and whatever time and climate that is, we need to be at the cutting edge of that. 1928, the Prophet got the Morris God newspaper. 
Now, if you look at what was going on in that period of time, there were a lot of Asiatic newspapers that were going on that people don't know about in this day, right? Marcus Garvey had the Negro World. There was one called the Black Chronicle. It was a bunch of them, probably, because that was the that was the mode of communication at that time to reach out people. Islam. Now, a lot of the newspapers now are, you know, and I'm going to my, my press press secretary back on this. One. A lot of the newspaper back, um, newspapers are going out of business or looking at going out of business because print media is not because everybody's on phones and computers. So all of them are now have set up websites, right, to, to parlay what they used to do in newspapers on the internet. Islam. So now when people want to know what the thought of Morris is on anything on the Morris subject, they're going to the internet. And we know the prophet spirit is not really being represented as it's supposed to on the internet. Right? So National Grand Sheik, uh, along with, you know, some, some faithful Morris here, are working on the national website to get that together because that's something we need to control the narrative. Islam Morris? Islam. All right? So now, I want to, um, so anybody ever heard of the ADL before? ADL? The ADL is known as the uh, Anti-Defamation League. The Anti-Defamation League is a Jewish organization that their whole job is to scan news, internet, whatever, and anything that's against the interests of Jews, they come together and, you know, attack it, right? Not physically, but just through, you know, response and doing research. Um, they, the ADL put out this, um, this article, it's entitled, Without Prejudice, uh, What Sovereign Citizens Believe. And that's by J.M. Berger. And um, I just wanted to go through some of the, well, could you put these over there? Right? So I just want to um, just read through a, you know, a couple points here. Um, I'm 715. So I'm talking to the president. All right. It says, a sovereign history of the United States. I just want to read some highlighted points that I, that I, I underlined. It says, um, the most fundamental tenet of the sovereign citizen movement is an alternate version of, the, of American history that roughly accords with the outline given below, along with a set of alternative laws that extend from history. Not all sovereigns understand, subscribe to, or care about every one of these points, but this broad narrative, narrative is fairly common within the movement. This understanding of history undergirds the sovereign ideological beliefs about legal powers and privileges, even if those invoking the powers and privileges are familiar with their derivation. Now, there's a lot of people that have even made their, their way in as sheiks that hold these ideals, right? It's very important to, because the National Grand Sheik hit it, like the education of our people in terms of what this is, this our movement is, it's too important to allow someone to sneak in, moving in the dark, injecting some mess that ain't got no business paying. Right. The only way we're gonna be able to understand it is understand their doctrine too. So, you know, the, and I don't wanna say burden, but the responsibility is on the Moors, you know, to really not just study our doctrine, right? But if we're responsible for teaching the prophet's lessons, we gotta know what's not of the prophet's lessons. Right. Islam, and that, again, that's in a particular language. It says, to support their belief, sovereign citizens frequently cite real laws, but their understanding of these laws in context is incorrect. And attempts to take action in accordance with the beliefs outlined here are almost always illegal, as hundreds of courts have ruled over the course of many years. Our prophet told us to be law-abiding citizens. Mm -hmm. Islam Morris? Mm -hmm. You know, prophet ain't, look, this is what I tell Morris all the time, you know, especially young Morris that come in. You know, prophet Noble Drale never told you nothing's going to get you locked up. Period. Somebody trying to sell you something, you got to risk your freedom, Mo. Because freedom is supposed to be one of our principles, right? That ain't enough to profit. Islam, you know, and also to, you know, make note that they said that, you know, they mixed, you know, real legal cases with some other stuff. You know, that's that's just how Satan knew, right? <laughs> you know, that's, that put me in the thought of the Nazarene, you know, our brother Jesus 2,000 years ago. You know, anytime the priest tried to set him up, you know, they'd quote, they would misquote the law. Or they would quote the law out of context. You know, him being a master of masters, that rap only they called him, you know, he would he would know where they were going and quote the law, the spirit and the letter. You're coming at me with the letter, but here's the spirit of that law you're talking about. You know, when he hit him with stuff like he who was without saying cast the first stone, he hit him with the spirit, none of them could move because they knew they was all guilty. <laughs> Islam, praise Allah. It says, in most cases, sovereigns use multiple sy synonyms for the terms given here. Sovereigns also believe capitalization and punctuation are extremely important in written law, and they may take issue with the capitalization of or punctuation used here. 
Concepts outlined below are present presented in an order intended to reflect cause and effect each building upon the previous. There are no definitive sovereign texts. Rather, adherents draw on a variety of published sources and increasingly on books, videos, and manifestos distributed over the internet. Thousands of pages of content online describe different variations on the sovereign theme. Adherents usually pick and choose from these elements and create their own individualized beliefs that loosely conform to this general template. Individual sovereign gurus who sometimes present themselves as attorneys or judges also promote specific versions of the sovereign worldview. Right here in Atlanta, um, there's an Asiatic that has a, you know, I just saw the flyer uh, yesterday. Um, he's teaching something about which we get into a little bit uh, about how to tap into this trust or whatever, right? Three hundred dollars a person, okay? To, to learn something that's gonna get you locked up, right? I personally take offense to that because that's in our state, yes, and our job is to clean that mess up. Now we not paying three hundred dollars to get up in there, but I want to see if we can contact him away from his lecture circuit and. You know, get a dialogue going to see you know what his intentions are, which his intentions are clear, right? But we want to state for the record that we're not about that, even if we got to do a press release denouncing it or something. You know, of course, we always run that up the chain to see if, if we have plans to do so. Islam Islam. All right? Now here's another thing. It says this is you know, now goes into topics. Now I'm just gonna hit these topics real quick before I go into them, right? Um, these are some so hot button sovereign citizen topics. The Fourteenth Amendment, common law commercial law, fictitious persons, declarations of sovereignty, redemption, financial conspiracy theories, and tax protesters, right? Now, these are all things that we, if you sit and listen to somebody long enough, you will hear this particular doctrine coming out. That's long, all right? Now, even with the 14th Amendment, why a lot of um, Moorish Americans bought into this aspect is because of a misunderstanding of what the prophet said in the article on Moorish literature, right? Where he said that the 14th and 15th amendments are not needed for the salvation of our people as American citizens. Islam? Moors took that and ran with it, not looking at the context. The context of that statement is because, and he says it a paragraph down when he talk, you know, talks about the, the, the North and South not being in unit, right? And during the, you know, the uh, Civil War, when they broke away, Part of the thing to bring them back in was their acceptance of the 14th Amendment. They had to accept that coming in. That was necessary for them to come back in as American citizens. Had nothing to do with us, right? But I talked to Moors and these and the again, surprised me a lot of grand sheiks, Mo. You know, they hold these ideals, you know. And if I'm wrong, Brother National Grand Sheik, or any one of my elders, please correct me. But I don't see that as the context that I'm possibly speaking in. Mm. Islam Moors? So I just want to read this section called 14th Amendment. It says, while most sovereigns have erroneous beliefs about the founding fathers and the early history of the United States, the most useful starting point for understanding the movement's alternate history is the adoption of the 14th Amendment in 1868. The 14th Amendment, which guaranteed citizenship to, guaranteed citizenship to slaves freed after the Civil War, states that, quote, all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. Now, that word it says, where it says, you have to be clear on the language. The prophet even tells, he said, read carefully the doctrines of the more science temple of America. Right. So by extension, you, you suppose that anything time you read something, you read it carefully, right? It says, it guaranteed citizenship. They didn't say it gave citizenship to you. That's right. Islam? Islam. So the prophet says the same, we were under the same constitution that never changed since 1774. So we were always citizens, but we just found ourselves in a, in a condition, right. right? But that doesn't mean that you, you have to proclaim. The prophet says in Acts 6, you have to proclaim your nationality, but that was certain things were stripped from us, so we didn't know that we were even part of this, right? We didn't know that this was ours. Islam? Right. Or we have a birthright to it, I should say. I don't want to sound too radical. Islam? Right. Right. It says, most of our citizens believe this amendment created a form of second-class citizenship, less empowered and more subject to the federal government, which is seen as distinct from the state-centered form of citizenship articulated in the Constitution. 14th Amendment citizens are seen as seen by sovereigns as inferior, limited, or in more extreme views as slaves. However, sovereigns believe that they can opt out of the 14th Amendment citizenship by understanding certain legal provisions and reclaiming, reclaiming their constitutional citizenship. Or as we know, as has been the practice lately, filing a bunch of paperwork. 
right? Um, which, you know, if you go on, you know, when you talk to these, um, these agencies, and then again, when I talked about the Homeland Security, I did mention too, we were visited by Homeland Security and the following year was FBI. And it was, it was the same series of questions, hadn't changed. But the second time they came, they were asking like, would you be willing to give up people that teach this? I said, well, that's, we're not permitted to do that. Now, as a member of our temple that's violating some laws, then we can have a conversation because, you know what I'm saying? You know, that's not, that violates who we are, right? But I'm not seeking employment for your organization. <laughs> Mobile, did I say that? Praise the Lord. Y'all state that for the record. May please know that I'm not seeking anything from you. Right? So just want to state that for the record. But um, but they call that domestic terrorism. The, the paper terrorism. They, they, you know, the people that's into this type of stuff, they've actually classified this as terrorism. Now, when you read the terrorism laws, you don't want no part to that. You know? But again, if you follow our prophet, he keeps you away from us. All you got to do is listen to what he said and live the life accordingly. Islam laws? Awesome. All right. Um, this is under a section called common law. I'm just going to do um, a paragraph and a sentence. It says, shortly after the unanimous ratification of the 14th Amendment in 1870, sovereigns believed the government was quietly overthrown by corrupt bankers who transformed the government into a corporation and subjected the American people to an entirely new set of commercial laws. In the sovereign narrative, this new set of commercial laws usurped the Constitution and overturned its protection for its citizens. This corporation is often referred to as the de facto government and is seen as illegitimate. You know, that's a part of the language they use, you know, this de facto or the de jure or this. Or the, you know, when they hear you talking like this, you know, with people that know law, they know you start fitting yourself in certain categories. Right, um, state police and even local now um, have all been briefed as to sovereign citizen ideology. Right, so if you get pulled over nowadays and you start using that stuff, they have a set of training they go right into. Right, um, there was a you know incident where uh, guy he you know he uh, pulled you know he got pulled over and he hung hung our flag outside his window. You know what I'm saying? So all the squad cars come out and they, you know, it had been a few other sovereign citizen incidents that took place. So politically, they, they chose not to engage, but he was fully surrounded. That could have went really bad, you know? But then there was the other sister, what was her name? Was it not Corrine? Corrine Gaines? Corrine Gaines? Yeah, they actually killed that sister, right? And again, you know, if I can be permitted to mention a name of an individual that teaches these ideologies, is that permissible? Our brother, if I can say that, Taj Tariq Bey, is an author of confusion. You know, because what happens is most of these ideologies can be traced back to a couple sources, right? And as an, you know, in the process of nation building, we have to figure out what we're going to do because these things cannot continue. Islam was, you know, um, you know, for my position on it, you know, we should, that should be something that is dealt with this weekend. You know, what is our position? How are we going to move when these things come up? Um, like the rise of the Morris incident, they got, you know, they got pulled over with paramilitary, you know, you know, outfits on with assault rifles, sawed off shotguns, all, thousands of rounds of ammunition got pulled over or, or gassed up on the side of the highway and it ended up being like a 16 hour standoff. You know, I, I immediately contacted the National Grand Chief, can we make a statement on this or should we? And he gave me clearance, and I wrote up a statement, submitted it, he cleared it. You know, I did it. And when we when we put the, um, you know, because we did a written press release and a video, um, we put the video up. I mean, it was kind of split because um, it reached about, because um, Brother Hakeem Bey did a sponsored ad for it so that they hit a wider audience. Um, we reached about 4,000 people. Um, we caught some slander, but I got a lot of, you know, direct messages, you know, inboxing people that were thanking me for taking the position. But I was like, you know, it would be more helpful if you thanked me openly. Don't move in the dark. Think openly, so that way you can you can you know take a stance. That this is wrong. Islam Morris? Praise Allah. Praise Allah. Says um, and also too another thing um to remember, and this is where the the computer aspect comes in. When you Google more Moorish Moorish American or more Science Temple of America, the first sites that come up have nothing to do with the temples. That's right. And what that simply is, is, it's not the fact that they, um, they've they uploaded uh, you know, more stuff than us or you know, there's more traffic to their sites or anything you know, like that. There's a way to go in and manipulate the algorithm 
you know, to, so where, if, you know, if you, I guess it's to pay a certain amount, whatever it is, your, the name of your organization, group, or business gets hit right to the top. And this is what the sovereigns are doing, right? So they can, because again, to them, it's a business, right? It's not a divine movement. It's not, you know, they're $300 a person, $1,500 a person for these packages that they're selling. Mm-hmm. Right, so from a business perspective, they they try they'll do whatever it takes to get put as the first. They don't want to be the three hundred short. Nobody's gonna scroll down that far, right. you know. If you're not about them first ten, you know, sites that's listed, they're not gonna go to you. Islam, Islam. you know. So this is the you know we have to be technologically savvy, you know, and we got we got to keep younger people around us, you know. Praise Allah, um, we try to get some. We try to send some pictures earlier. The Moors called me to help him, but the one that taught me how to do that was my three-year-old grandson. He's three, Mo. Mm-hmm. He taught me. I didn't have to send no pictures on them phones with no buttons, Mo. <laughs> you know, this Mo, he's sending pictures, playing games at three. You know, so yeah, exactly, Mo. I'm telling you, Mo, it's electrified age, Mo. <laughs> Islam, all right. So praise Allah. Um, oh, it's, Mo, we gotta catch up, Mo. We can't get left behind this thing. As long as we want to be effective. Now I know y'all heard this when they talk about fictitious persons. Now that just that UCC mess. Right? It says because the UCC provides and, and this is what the UCC was really for actually Because the UCC provides an interstate Standard for things such as driver's licenses Property, ownership and bank accounts Many sovereigns believe that these documents And associated laws and financial Obligations do not apply to them But instead to a fictitious person Created by illegitimate law Sometimes referred to as the straw man some believe a fictitious person is, is denoted in legal documents by listing his or her name in all capital letters. The fictitious person is a legal entity akin to a company with the same name as the citizens sovereigns believe. With the job forms, um, I praise a lot as people are sending them, we can help scan those job forms because we've had to call people that send that stuff in. It's like that question that says, are you a United States citizen? And they're checking, no, we call them most with Islam. Well, what do you, could you explain that? And they go into this whole thing, you know, and we have to state for the record, well, we want to make sure before you join this here that you don't hold these ideas because we don't teach that. Right. Islam? Islam. Um, you know, I hope that's, I hope you don't mind, but the National Grand Sheikh. Um, but we're trying to save y'all some headaches because we don't want you to have to deal with all the, if we can short stop some of the headaches, but we, we don't mind doing that. All right. It says um, some sovereigns create their own driver's licenses and license plates because they believe the state issued documents are inauthentic as they refer to the fictitious person and that using or signing these documents exposes them to vulnerabilities under the illegitimate and tyrannical commercial laws, including debt collection, arrest and prosecution. Islam All right. Then they get into the whole thing about sovereignty. Right now, the word we're not adverse to the word sovereignty. The word sovereignty is actually in our Quran. We're not adverse to it, but in context. Islam. But here they're saying, is, okay, let me take it from the side. It says, to fully claim immunity from illegitimate laws related to U.S. Code and UCC, many sovereigns believe that they can take certain legal steps and invoke specific language and principles. I believe our prophet gave us a set of principles, right? This, this frequently includes writing and filing a florid declaration of sovereignty that renounces the fictitious person and associated entities and claiming the rights and privileges of a common law citizen. The precise language varies. Declaration of sovereignty can often be a very complex and appear incoherent to someone who is not versed in the movement's particular rules and pseudo-legal principles. This complexity has created a space for opportunistic groups and individuals to sell legal filing kits and guidelines to would-be sovereigns, often for hundreds of dollars or more. Islam Morris? Islam. All right? So this is what it's all about. It's all about fleecing the people. It's not about cleaning them up. It's not about raising the nation. You know, there was a there was a sovereign citizen group around my area of the country. I'm originally from um, Atlantic City, New Jersey, around that area. And they were, you know, somehow they were able to get like, like $3 million with the stuff they were doing. And, you know, with the federal government, we know what, how they move. They'll, they'll let you have a run. Five, seven years, maybe 10 years. And just build the case. Which is why when they come back, you know, come after you, the case is almost airtight. Because they've been watching you for that, that long. But in the process of them getting this $3 million, they didn't build no school, not a clinic, none of that kind of stuff. They're running back and forth with France to France, hanging out with the Europeans. Because <laughs> they're not race conscious, Mo. They not. They don't care about their race. They don't care nothing about their people. They're here to fleece the people, Islam. Huh? All right? Um, we also had a brother, have a brother. Um, it's actually in law school right now. Um, Allah willing, he'll be graduating, what, next year? Yeah. And... Um, 
you know, ironically, you know, when he first came to us, he was a sovereign citizen. And he said, you know what? You know, he took the prophet lesson. You know, he loved the prophet, but he was, you know, you know, he was at variance a little bit. But he went to law school. He said law school is enabling him to be able to see what the prophet was saying. You know, so he's uh, trying to make a speedy reparation from his former ways. Islam was? So praise Allah for that. Okay. Um, I'm just going to hit one more thing, and then I'm going I'm to bring gratitude, Mom. Okay. Um, then I'm going to you know, touch on this, and then I'm going to, you know, take it back to the prophet. Because I don't want to put up too much of this confusion in the ethos without trying to back to our prophet. Um, so again, with these movements, these sovereign citizen movements, first of all, the origins of all of them are all European. In terms of Asiatics that grabbed these movements, that stuff didn't really start becoming popular until around the 90s. You know, when a lot of these moors started going and sitting with these Europeans to learn ways to get over them. You know, and that's what it was all about. Um, there's a couple incidents that took place in the country that, you know, people saw the event but not, might not have known that the backdrop of that was people that were sovereign citizens. The, um, the, uh, the Oklahoma City bombing, you know, that was uh, the, the people that did that, sovereign citizens. Uh, the Unabomber, sovereign citizen. Um, I don't know if y'all remember in the 90s, um, the Ruby Ridge incident, um, that was sovereign citizens. Uh, Republic of Texas down in, when they tried to overthrow the, you know, the government in Texas. Uh, I think that was 93 or 4, something like that. Again, sovereign citizens. But again, all of these are Europeans, right? We don't have no business over there. Islam? Now, the oldest version, the oldest group that this, that this thought can be traced back to is a group called Christian Identity, right? Now, I, I believe our prophet told us. Matter of fact, I, I have faith in the fact that the prophet taught us about to return to church and Christianity, no? Because mm -hmm. it was founded for somebody else's salvation, Islam. Mm -hmm. Now, if you hold the ideas from a group that calls itself Christian identity, now again, let's be clear, this ain't, this ain't the teachings of Jesus. This is something different, Islam. Listen to this. And again, this is from the ADL. Under Christian identity, it says, Christian identity is a religious ideology popular in extreme right-wing circles. Adherents believe that, and this is their language more, it's not mine. Adherents believe that whites of European descent can be traced back to the lost tribes of Israel. Many consider Jews to be the satanic, this is them most, the satanic offspring of Eve and the serpent, while non-whites are mud people created before Adam and Eve. Its virulent, racist, and anti-Semitic beliefs are usually accompanied by extreme anti-government sentiments. Despite its small size, Christian identity influences virtually all white supremacists and extreme, extreme anti-government movements. It has also informed criminal behavior uh, ranging from hate crimes to acts of terrorism, right? And it says, um, go down, pardon me, right? And it says, Christian identities origins can be traced back to the 19th century in Great Britain, where a small circle of religious thinkers advanced the idea known as British Israelism or Anglo-Israelism that modern Europeans were biologically descended from the ancient Israelites of the Old Testament, specifically from the lost tribes scattered by the invasions of the Hittites, prophet taught us about them, Assyrians and Babylonians. The lost tribes had purportedly made their way to Europe and from them descended the modern European nationality. So this is the Europeans again trying to take birthrights from Asiatics. Mm -hmm. Islam? So even in the sovereign citizen thought, it's still about birthright theft. Mm -hmm. So we really look like fools being over there. Mm -hmm. Islam was? Islam. All right? So, you know, yeah, I don't want to burden them more. Right? There's a lot of information, and, you know, over time, you know, we'll be, you know, doing our research so we can properly address this stuff from an intelligent perspective. You know, because a lot of times people don't think that Moorish Americans, Moorish more American Muslims under the prophet can, can, you know, respond in an intelligent tone from an academic perspective. They don't think we can do that. Right? Um, however, when I read literature from our prophet, it's very, you know, it has a flow to it. You know, that in the prophets, they grabbed the professionals as well as the grassroots people. That's not more, you know. So, you know, that's the thing that we should work on too is to, you know, how do we present, you know, how do we represent the prophet's movement? Islam? Let now let's talk about some of the things the prophet was doing in his day. Okay. So now let's, let's listen to what, what type of organization the prophet, you know, uh, created. What type of Moors he was supposed to be coming out of his institution and his movement. This is from a Moorish God newspaper. His date was October 26, 1928. It says, under an article entitled The Moorish Science Temple of America. It says, The Moorish Science Temple of America was founded by the Prophet Noble Jurali. Aside from the fact that it is a legally 
organized religious corporation. It is building on human needs to this desirable end and time legitimate means will be found to dispense charity and provide for the mutual assistance of its members in times of distress, to aid in the improvement of health and to encourage the ownership of better homes, to find employment for our members, to teach those fundamental principles which are desired for our civilization, such as obedience to law, loyalty to government, tolerance, and unity. It is most earnestly hoped that the Moorish Science Temple of America will not in any way be confused with any Back to Africa movement. Such is not important important insofar as the American citizens of our group colonizing Africa are concerned. Islam Morris, the language in that, those two paragraphs is very clear and very specific, right? First of all, he made clear that this is a legitimate organization, right? We're not trying to break any laws or any of that. Second, you're, we're American citizens. Islam? And then the whole, you know, uh, to the, the mutual assistance of our members, so on and so forth. Because in that day, you know, we know our prophet was divinely prepared, so he came right on time. When you look at the era that he came in, there's something, if you if you do a research on it, it's called, they call it the age of fraternalism, right? Which was mid-1800s to about the mid-1900s. And all these various different groups, you know, uh, brother uh, mentioned the Elks, Prince Hall Masons, Shriners, the, um, the, all the Greek letter fraternities, so on and so forth. All of them are popping up around the same time along with the UNIA and the Moorish Science Temple of America. Right? Because in those days, um, and I, and, 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 pardon me, but I don't remember the source that I got this from, so forgive me. But um, no, it was our brother Sharif Hanna Elvet, he said this. Um, that in that day, you know, you couldn't just go and take out life insurance for yourself. Remember, this is the 20s, this is the teens, this is late 1800s, right? So your, your insurance, right, was you joining one of these, you know, what they call them mutual aid societies, right? Paying dues, being a member in good standing, and if you got in, you know, uh, in an emergency situation, you lost a job or couldn't buy food or whatever, you will go to the organization. The organization, you know, and again, the prophet makes a, a statement in the uh, Morris literature when he talks about, um, you know, act accordingly to the some paraphrase, paraphrase a little bit, act according to the procedure of performing emergency act, but he doesn't explain it. So it's almost like you're supposed to know what that is because in that day that he's made the statement, that other groups were doing the same thing. Islam Morris? Islam. All right? So this is what the, you know, the, the temple's supposed to be for. Like, you know, there is supposed to be a benefit derived from being a card holding man. That card's supposed to mean something. Mm, that's right. Islam? Because we don't want it to burn up in our pockets. Islam? All right. All right? Let me move forward. It says, um... Okay? I just want to read from, and this is from the, um... The, uh, the article entitled Convention of Big Success. So I think that would be good for us to read really quick. It says it's under the section entitled Prominent Men Speak. It says on Tuesday night was held the formal opening with many prominent speakers among them. And again, we, we know this because we've read it a million times. But listening to the officers of the people that were a member of the movement, right? Alderman Lewis B. Anderson, who delivered the welcome address to the delegates and visitors. Dr. C.V. Roman of Mahari Medical College of Nashville, Tennessee, was a pleasant surprise speaker who was in the city in the interest of the con congressional campaign of Oscar de Priest. The Honorable Daniel M. Jackson, judge, was absent because of business with the government at Springfield, Illinois, but was represented by attorney Aaron Payne, who, was deli who delivered a very forceful address, touching on many things of interest to the Moorish Americans. Notwithstanding the fact that the Honorable Oscar de Priest, as well as the Alderman Anderson, was very busy with the campaign, they took time to stay throughout the meeting, and the closing address was delivered by the Honorable Oscar de Priest. Now, if I just pause there, imagine us being in a damn time now where, you know, in our list of people that's coming to represent at the convention are, are these people that are judges and attorneys and congressmen. Islam, Islam. this is what our prophet put together, on, you know? Sure. But it's our infighting and stuff, the way we, you know, that causes us to fall away from that. Because one thing with, you know, about professional people, you know, see, they, they took time to go to college and get their degrees and do whatever. They don't want to be around no murders, moors in the streets killing each other, and kidnapping each other stuff that took place when the lights went out. Islam? Islam. Right? If you look at um, Brother Aaron Payne, Aaron Payne, after the time of the prophet, he went on to, you know, uh, you know, uh, represent what was Joe Lewis, and he went on with his professional career to his understanding. Islam was, you know? So we have to make this movement where it's appealing to people, because in all walks of life, people know they need this. 
but are we presenting it properly where they say, yeah, I can go and sit over there and feel comfortable? Right. That's right. Islam? Right. There's a lot of uh, young rappers, not young, but rappers that are um, using the prophet's lessons in their songs now. Yeah. This is going on. Yeah. Yes. Um, but again, you know, when you, you know, get to how they got it, they didn't get it through a temple. Right. They might have got it from the Black Stones, you know, the street organization from Chicago. Um, they might have got it from a sovereign citizen group. Islam, mm -hmm. you know, uh, there's a rapper named Nas. He, you know, one of his albums, he, you know, he had all the symbols and stuff we have on our 10 Wonders of the World. You know, he had them right on his album cover. You see? Um, but again, it's like, you know, our brothers right now, he's worth like a billion dollars. You know, like, can we get established an environment where a billionaire can stay amongst us and feel comfortable? You know, again, that, you know, in my assessment, that's the work. That's not, and again, not just for them, but it's because, you know, I know we love the grassroots work, which, you know, again, that's beautiful, right? But we can't, because there's a whole, it's supposed to be a holy unity between the rich and poor. You know, we got a chapter on that. So we have to find a way to bring that together. That's right. That's not All right. This is an article entitled um, Jackson Secede, again, Morris guy, Jackson Secede, Edward H. Wright. It says the appointment of the Honorable Daniel M. Jackson, prominent Republican leader, second ward committeeman, and one of the city's most successful businessmen as Illinois Commerce Commissioner by Governor Lynn Smalls meets the lasting satis satisfaction of his host of friends in Chicago and throughout the United States. Those, who, those of us who have had dealings with this remarkably successful man know that the secrets of his success and the high esteem in which he is held is due to his unselfishness. While he has been a successful businessman, the underlying principle of his life has always been the desire to help others. Now, if he's rubbing elbows with the Moors, where he get that teaching from? Our Quran. Islam Moors? It says it stands to his record that he has given without, without show or display to the appeals made for the cause of Missions, education, employment, religious institutions, and the poor. This is the man unselfish and unassuming of broad sympathies, liberal charities, and of business acumen, the Honorable Daniel M. Jackson. So this is a judge running for office, endorsed by the Moors, that's using the prophet's platform to make itself appealing to all. Right? So the prophet demonstrated the possibilities of man of in terms of what this movement is capable of doing. But in the wrong hands, what may, you know, what may do good can also do harm. Islam, all right? So I just want to demonstrate that, Morris. And um, just one more thing from the Morris God, Morris, and I'll yield the floor. These are letters, again, from the Morris God. These are letters written in uh, for, the, you know, different people giving honors to the prophet for his birth, right? his birthday, his manifestation day. Uh, because they weren't be, wouldn't be able to attend. This is, um, it says, this is from Oscar the Priest. It says, kindly accept my hearty congratulations on your birthday. May you be personally be spared for many years to come and for the great service you are rendering to the Moorish American Temple. Again, Oscar the Priest. Uh, this is from Representative George W. Blackwell. Duties here in Springfield prevent me being present on the occasion of your birthday. I congratulate you and wish you, the members of the great Moorish organization, continued success. Keep on teaching the men and women, men, women and children, love, truth, peace, freedom, and justice. Here we have a judge quoting our five principles. Islam? Islam says, hearty congratulations upon your birthday. May you have many more. Senator A.H. Roberts. I wish to congratulate you upon your birthday and the great work you are doing. Judge Francis Borelli. I sound like it's Borelli. That's like a European to me, Bo. Congratulations, Prophet, for your birthday. Praise the Lord. It says, uh, it takes great pleasure in congratulating you on your birthday and wish you many years of continued success, good health, and happiness. Judge Joseph Burke. Right? And it says, all the Moors wish you happy uh, a happy birthday. And that's from Brother F. Nelson Bay from Detroit, Michigan. So, Morris, clearly the prophet was not an enemy to the government. That's right. Well, you, know, I, I, you know, I believe there's a statement that said, the European is helping me, why aren't you? Mm. Now, when you look at the Europeans that were helping him, right, you know, these are people that shape policy, make laws in the secular government, right? So, the prophet was not adverse. He was not an enemy to that because you can't get nothing done being an enemy to that. Right. Right? Um, one of the things that stands out to me in the convention pictures a lot of times, 
the, you know, the, the, the bigger convention picture um, when the prophet was on the manifest was the amount of American flags that were in the background. Everywhere, to me, almost more than the Moorish flag. Right. Proving the point of, or you know, making the point known about us being American citizens and how important that was, right? And here we are in the 21st century, century and if you talk to the average one of our people, we still have a disenfranchised thought. So many years later, right? So that means a couple things. Either one, you know, people, well, you know, people, you know, just you know, hard-headed don't want to listen, or two, that somewhere along the line, as a nation, we dropped the ball in terms of our purpose of what we were supposed to be getting to our people. Islam, right. you know, and this message is for all of our people, right. right? Not just the ones who have proclaimed their LMB, but those that don't know who they are. Right. See, and it's a lot of times, it's very easy to get in a comfort zone, you know, and just wanting to be around and talk to more, right? But we got to talk to our brothers and sisters because um, I can look around this room and I can almost guarantee that most of us in this room were not born Moorish American. You know, we didn't have L and Bay attached to our name. I can't say that in all settings because now we got children coming in, you know, born L and Bay. So praise a lot for that. But um, you know, we just have to, you know, you know, move more from a spirit of love and more than us. You know, I, you know, I say this and I, I close out. Um, more than us um, seeking to be right all the time. When we look at a prophet, you know, you know, describes the higher self and he talks about the mother of virtues, virtues and harmonies of life, breeding justice, mercy, love, and right. If you look in that, that order, right is last. You got justice, mercy, and love before you get a chance to be right. Islam. So, so if people don't feel the love that you're coming from, they're not gonna hear the message. Right. Islam, Moors. You know.